All right. So, pretty cool animation there, huh? All right. So, we're going to talk about the functions of the heart today. The heart is a muscular pump. That's its job. Its job is to pump the blood to the tissues or to the lungs to get oxygen and then comes back to the heart and then the heart pumps it to the tissues, that freshly oxygenated blood. So it's a muscular pump. And it's a side-by-side -side pump because the right side of the heart, if you look at your some of your um, worksheets that you had to work on, the right side of the heart pumps blood to the lungs and the left side of the heart pumps blood to the, to the body. So the right side of the heart has deoxygenated blood, not yet gone to the lungs, so it's used up blood from the body going to the lungs. And then the left side of the heart has oxygenated blood that it's going to pump to the body, and that blood came from the lungs. So it's a side-by-side -side muscular pump. So if you think about general functions of the heart, let me look at it as, a, as an organ. So it generates a pressure. So blood pressure is based on how well your heart is functioning. If your heart doesn't have a very strong force of contraction, your blood pressure will be lower. If your vessels are, are narrow, blood pressure will be higher, meaning the, blood, the heart has to work harder to pump blood through those narrow vessels. And what will narrow our blood vessels? What main product in our food? Cholesterol, yes, yeah, saturated fats. Um, cause cholesterol deposits on the inside of our blood vessels over time. And that process can start in the teens. So people think that be just because they're a teenager and they're active and they're young in their 20s, they can eat all this you know, high saturated fat foods like chips and donuts and muffins and pizza and burgers and fries. But that builds up over time. So we start to see fatty streaks on the vessels in people that are in their 20s and 30s. And it also depends on how well your liver produces HDL, which is kind of the cleanup chemical that cleans up the cholesterol out of your vessels. So some of that is genetic as well, because we find people that are very good eaters, good exercisers, and have high cholesterol levels just because their liver doesn't produce very much HDL. So you want a high HDL level and a low LDL, which is the bad cholesterol that contributes to, to fatty streaks and narrow vessels and eventually clots, leading to heart attack and stroke. So generating that pressure, routing the blood. So we talked about how the right side of the heart pumps to the lungs, the left side of the heart pumps to the, to the system. We call it the systemic circulation, which is the body tissues. And ensuring a one-way flow, and the number one structure that ensures that blood doesn't go backwards through the heart is, are the heart valves. So very, very important you understand. Heart valves, one-way flow, highlight those terms. And then regulating blood supply. Depending if we're exercising, the heart's going to beat faster and stronger to feed those exercising tissues. If we're sleeping or resting, watching television, the heart rate will be slower, force of contraction much lesser because the de demands of the tissues are not as high. If we look at where the heart is located, it's in the center of the chest. So when we do bypass surgery, we cut right down the center of the sternum, we separate the ribs, and we go in after the heart. It's in the mediastinum, specifically in the pericardial cavity. But if you look at it, it's a little bit tilted to the left. The apex is more to the left of the midline. So that's the part that beats up against the chest wall. So that's to the left of the midline. That's why we tend to put our hands over the left side of our heart, right, when we're saying the Pledge of Allegiance or whatever. That's because it's a little bit more oriented to the left side of the heart than um, in the middle or the right. But it's in the center of the chest, and it's about the size of an adult fist in terms of size. So looking at layers around the heart, we talked about these in the lab, so we're not going to go into a lot of detail, just that the parietal pericardium is on the outside. It attaches the heart to the, the cavity around it, to the body cavity. And then there's the visceral pericardium, which lies right directly on the heart. And then there's a space in between there called the pericardial cavity, which is filled with fluid. So every time your heart contracts and fills with blood back and forth, it's getting bigger and smaller. That doesn't hurt because there's a nice fluid in there, and it doesn't rub up against the body wall. Unless you have pericarditis, which is an inflammation of these membranes, which can be caused by just the common cold, just a simple virus can invade that pericardial tissue and cause inflammation, and then it hurts when a person takes a deep breath, when they lie in a certain position, the, the pressure on those pericardial membranes can cause discomfort. I had this last year, last fall. Um, I was 
refinishing a basement with my husband and we were working, you know, working here during the day and working there until midnight, drywalling, taping and mudding. I got myself probably exhausted without realizing it and I noticed every time I bent over, my chest would hurt. Or if I laid in bed, if I laid on my left side, my chest would hurt. And I thought, what is that? I wasn't short of breath. I didn't have any other symptoms other than this positional change in, or positional pain in my chest. Went to the doctor. They did an EKG. Luckily, it wasn't bad enough that it caused actual rhythm issues because if you constrict that pericardial cavity, then the heart can't fill with blood and contract as well. Then you start to see rhythm changes as a result of that. Mine wasn't that bad. So all it took was just um, high doses of ibuprofen for, what, six weeks? And it went away and it was not a problem. So, But it can be more severe. My brother had it, ironically, a couple years before I did um, at the same age. And his was much more advanced because he didn't go in soon enough and um, he was in a lot, a lot of pain. So just something to be aware of. But does it affect the blood flow if you have inflammation on the outside membranes? It doesn't. So it's not a very serious condition as long as you catch it early. So other tissues then. The epicardium is kind of the same as the visceral pericardium. It's that outer layer of the heart. The myocardium is the thick muscular layer. That's the, that's the layer that we worry about. When you talk about heart attack, uh, when a blood clot gets into an artery serving the myocardium, that myocardium, those contractile muscle cells, can't beat, and therefore it's not pumping blood, and then the body dies. So the myocardium needs a rich supply of glucose and oxygen to keep going. So we need blood vessels feeding the myocardium free and clear, not no clots there supplying that fresh blood to keep it pumping. And the endocardium is the smooth inner lining of the heart. And endocarditis is very serious compared to pericarditis, right? Because endocarditis is inflammation of that inner lining of the heart. And it's very slippery and uh, shiny when we look at our sheep heart on the, on the endocardium to allow friction-free environment for blood to flow through that heart. So if a person is an intravenous drug user, they're at risk for endocarditis because they have these dirty particles running through their blood that they're injecting into their veins and then causes inflammation of the heart. It can damage its function and cause permanent disability. And we see that in young people that are heroin users that they end up having endocarditis and permanent heart damage as a result of that. So you can see how thick the myocardium is here, all these contracting muscle cells. And then this thin outer layer is that epicardium or visceral pericardium. So looking at external anatomy, we talked about this in lab. I'm not going to talk about that too much more here. Just remember the left ventricle is here, and then it's divided by this interventricular septum into the right ventricle on this side, and then we have the two atria on top. So looking at the circulation over the surface of the heart, this is key because you've got to keep this heart muscle alive. So the, the coronary arteries supply blood to the outside of the heart. Where do those arteries start? I can see the, the base of the left and right coronary artery kind of shaded out here. Where do they start? Where's our freshest blood? At the base of the aorta. Yep, that's where those vessels start. At the base of the aorta, then they supply fresh blood over the surface of the heart to keep that myocardium myocardium functioning. And then when that blood is all used up from those heart muscle cells, it returns back to the heart through the cardiac veins and this collecting vessel here called the coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus leads to where? What is the receiving chamber of the heart for used blood, deoxygenated blood? Which side? Which side has the blue? You'd had that in your worksheet. The right atrium, yep. Yeah. So the coronary sinus leads to the right atrium and it's gonna bring that used up blood back to the heart to send it back to the lungs and start that whole circulation over again. So when a person has bypass surgery, we're looking at these vessels, seeing which ones are so narrowed, so clogged with plaque that we have to go around them. We have to go get another vessel from somewhere else in the body and bypass that clogged artery. So we see it very commonly you know, this vessel right here that we have to go around that clotted area with a new vessel. Just like a, you know, in the interstate system, we have bypass ramps, right, to go from one interstate to another. Yes? Exactly, yep. So if you have triple bypass, they had to do three bypasses around vessels. Yep, yep. Quadruple bypass. Yep, yep. Good question. 
So here are the valves that we talked about in lab. I'm not going to hold you accountable for anatomy in lecture, but know the function, right? It's to prevent the blood from flowing backwards in the heart. So the AV valves are called, the right AV valve is tricuspid, mitral is the left AV. They prevent backward flow from, because the atria receive the blood, right? Then it goes to the ventricles through those AV valves. So when the ventricles contract, the AV valves shut and prevent that blood from going back to the atria. We don't want backward flow. We want forward flow through the heart. So here's a nice animation of the valves. Don't you do that to me now. No. Hmm. Well, what is, oh, and my animation is gone too. Well, sorry about that. We're just going to pause here for a minute. All right, so we're going to look at the heart valves here. And the sound you hear when you hear the heartbeat, when you put a stethoscope over someone's chest, you hear the lubbed up, lubbed up, lubbed up. You're hearing the slamming of the valves closing, giving you that lubbed up sound. So when you know, when you look at the AV valves and you compare them to the valves at the base of the major vessels, which are the aortic valve and the pulmonary valve, which have the chordae tendinae attached to them, those strings? Yeah, the AV valves. So when they shut, they have more of a, a, a vibration when they shut. It's like a lub, lub. When you say the word lub, there's a little more of a vibration there versus dup. Wouldn't you agree? Lub, dup. So the, the semilunar valves at the base of the aortic, uh, aorta and the pulmonary artery um, are a little differently shaped, and you'll see it in this animation, and they just have a, a tighter closing sound. It's a dup. So it's lubbed up, lubbed up. So let's listen to that and we'll look at the valves. Left AV valve. Go back just a little bit here. Turn that off for just a minute here. So here is your left AV valve. Here's the aortic valve at the top of the, so this is all the left ventricle here, right? So blood is coming in from the lungs to the left atrium, goes through the mitral valve, has the strings attached to the left ventricle. Then when the ve left ventricle contracts, it forces this AV valve shut, and that's the first heart sound, the lub. And then it contracts, pushes this open, the aortic valve, when it contracts, right, and blood flows in, and then as the heart relaxes, the blood wants to come backward toward the heart, right? But this valve will prevent that backflow. So as the blood flows backward and hits this valve, it shuts that semilunar valve, and that's the dup. And this is happening on both sides of the heart. So both AV valves are closed when the ventricles are doing what? The AV valves close when the ventricles are contracting. contracting. And the semilunar valves at the base of the aorta and the pulmonary artery close when the ventricles are doing what? Relaxing. Relaxing. When it relaxes, the blood flows back and it slams those semilunar valves shut. So that's the lubbed up sound you hear with ventricular contraction and relaxation. So the AV valves are closing with the lub, the semilunar valves are closing with the dup. And sometimes you'll hear a third heart sound, and it's at the beginning of that relaxing, right after the dup. That can be normal. Um, in some people. So that's something a cardiologist would evaluate. But anytime we hear extra sounds, like when I listen to a heart of someone who has an artificial valve, it's, you know, they're, they're not quite the same material, so they sound differently. So when I hear it, it sounds like a, like a whoosh sound. It sounds like a whoom, boom, whoom, boom, whoom, boom. That's a mechanical valve sound. 
or other times you'll hear a swishing sound and that's a murmur. So if you've ever been told you have a heart murmur or someone else has a heart murmur, it just means that that valve isn't closing completely, whether it's the semilunar valves at the base of the aorta pulmonary artery or it's the AV valves, one of them, is, and they'll diagnose it based on where they put their stethoscope, it just means the blood is flow is, is going backwards. You have a little bit of backflow. That, blood, that, that valve is not closing completely. So we see that sometimes in some people. So depending where they want to assess what valve is what, they put their stethoscope over these red areas of the heart. So it's not important that you would have to know that. As a nurse, I don't have to know that. Even working on a cardiac unit, that's for a cardiologist or a physician's assistant or a, you know, an advanced practice nurse to, who's working in cardiology. They need to know that, they, that information. But just so you know, when they're going over across your chest, they're listening to the different parts of the heart and the valve function. So then we have the cardiac cycle. The cardiac cycle just kind of tells us what's happening throughout the heart, where things are moving. And this is just um, showing you blood flow. So you did this as part of your study guide, right? Looking at the different parts of the heart. So I'm not gonna go through that. Just be able to trace one red blood cell as it comes in through the superior and inferior vena cava. Where does it go from there? It goes to the right atrium, right ventricle, up the pulmonary artery to the lungs, picks up oxygen there, so that's where we see the change of blood from blue to red. Then it comes back to the heart via the four pulmonary veins, to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, up to the aorta, and then to the rest of the body. So you should definitely know blood flow through the heart for the lecture exam. And if we put the two sides of the heart together, we can see the, the pulmonary circulation is showing here the right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs, picks up oxygen, comes back to the veins, to the left side of the heart. The left side of the heart pumps via the aorta. And we look at the blood vessels in lab, right? We have the carotid arteries heading up toward the head. And then we have the thoracic and abdominal, abdominal aorta, which is gonna bring it all down to the rest of the body. So these major branches here are representing the carotid arteries and the abdominal aorta, depending where it's taking that. But the right side of the heart is the pulmonary circuit, serving the lungs. The left side of the heart we call the systemic circuit, serving the body tissues. So if you look at how the muscle cells are arranged in the heart, they kind of wrap around the ventricles nicely. So when the ventricles contract, they, it's like squeezing a rag. When you want to get every little bit of water out of a rag, don't you kind of twist the rag at the, at the end? The same thing occurs in the heart. We have these rings that uh, support the valves because the valves are working hard from the minute our heart starts to beat in utero to the time we die you know, 80 to 100 beats a minute, that's a long time. That's a lot of pressure on those valves. So they have those fibrous rings to support them. And then the, the muscle, like I said, is has this arrangement to have a twisting sensation when the heart pumps. So we're squeezing blood from the apex of that heart muscle all the way up to the base, and then it leaves via the major vessels at the surface of the heart. So we'll stop at this point, and we'll pick up with cardiac muscle when we come back on Thursday.